the era of deficit denial in Washington is over. Did you hear that, Jess? They're finally gonna fix things. Hope and change, Jess, hope and change. Then? Yeah. Who are something else? Yeah, why do you keep making us watch this? You know it was from before I was born. Nothing happened. That's right. In 2010, President Obama, filled with a, a hope and change fire, or perhaps to secure additional political favor, set out to investigate this whole debt problem. Uh, oh dear, I probably should do something about this. Uh, I've got it. Uh, I'll call down fellow Democrat, former White House uh, Chief of Staff uh, Erskine Bowles, and former Republican Senator Alan Simpson. Uh, now, uh, their mission, should they choose to accept it, uh, would be to find ways to cut down the evil national deficits uh, that are maliciously racking up more and more debt uh, upon our poor country. And they need to do it before, uh, before, you know, it's too late. And all hope is lost. Officially, it was the Bipartisan National Commission on Fiscal Responsibility and Reform. Their express goal was to identify, quote, policies to improve the fiscal situation in the medium term and to achieve fiscal sustainability over the long run. So how'd they do? This, well, Silas, <laughs> chairman of the Federal Reserve, this is the most important tool I have. And due to COVID, they let me bring it home so I can work from home. Looks like an ordinary printer, but you press this button right here, and a trillion dollars enters the money supply. This button? Yeah, this one right here. Is there any harm in doing it? Yeah. So, yeah. We maybe haven't learned our lesson quite as well as Erskine there in the beginning had hoped. We've kind of printed a whole lot since then. Bowles and Simpson, after their research, concluded that we were on a dangerous path if we did not change our spinthrift ways. Here's what they said. There is no soul left in America who doesn't understand that this deficit is like a tank. It's gonna destroy our country from within. Oh, I pulled up the wrong version of that clip. Oh well, that's just something special I threw together for you. I'll show you the rest of it here in a bit. Anyway, you get the point. Somehow, just a decade after the conclusion of their report, we find ourselves on an even worse trajectory than they had presented as, as what would happen if we didn't make any changes. The Congressional Budget Office offered two projections on the future of American debt. Either the balance sheet was on course to look like this, or this. And this is what actually transpired. Our national debt just passed 100% of our country's gross domestic product, GDP, the, the total value of goods produced and services provided in our country in a single year. That's for the first time since World War II. And, and those official numbers were before the $1.9 trillion stimulus bill was signed last year. And now they're arguing yet another almost $2 trillion bill in Congress, as if the whole debt situation doesn't even matter. Cause there ain't no kind of trouble that can't be fixed by a bubble. So grab your Mac, add some stacks to the Fed ass printing. We bought a drone just for pictures with some Fed ass printing. Paid his tuition, this edition, all from Fed ass printing. To make it rain, all you're needing is some Fed ass printing. Running up the debt. So does this all matter? What's the worst that could happen? Or are these all just numbers that at this point have gotten so large they don't really have any meaning? Now I asked all of you and an overwhelming majority of you said yes, yes it does matter. It is in fact a huge problem that will not end well. And I have to admit, my bias, based on the research I've done, but also based on instinct and logic, my bias tends very strongly towards that answer as well. Yes, printing money is a very powerful tool that developed nations can leverage in times of great need. Just look at how we used it in the 1940s as we were in the throes of World War II. But a big difference between then and now is that we obviously had a plan to ratchet those debt levels back down after that crisis was over, as our debt to GDP levels fell from 120% down to about 30% over the following decades. But over this last decade, despite Obama's commission to talk about it, no meaningful policy actions have been taken to combat this threat. When Greece saw a similar trend line with their debt to GDP, it wasn't long before they experienced a sovereign debt crisis. 
As a result, their economy shrunk by a quarter. Unemployment jumped to 25%. The state seized assets. Bank limited ATM withdrawals. Extremist political parties gained ground. There were food lines, anti-austerity protests, and violence. Yes, the United States' situation as a country is very different from that of Greece. But that doesn't mean you should ignore what happened there. Their meltdown does show us the social and political consequences of an extreme fiscal crisis. This highlights what can happen if the government loses control of fiscal policy. So how is our situation different? Well, some economists believe that because we are paying back our debt in our own currency, and because we have the power to print our own money, that we could never be subject to those same kinds of consequences suffered by the people of Greece. Perhaps that's why 15% of you said that our debt issue either isn't a problem, or at least isn't really that big of a problem. Here's economist Jason Furman, who was chair of the Council of Economic Advisors to President Obama and opposed the recommendations made by the Simpson-Bowles Commission. The United States isn't gonna default on its debt. Um, we borrow in our own currency, so there's zero default risk. You could point to Japan, as Furman and others do, as an example of an economy more similar to ours, who has, since their financial crisis in 1989, continued to push the debt to GDP envelope. But I believe, all this money printing does is allow us to kick the can down the road, ultimately making the consequences that we do suffer, if we don't find a way to course correct, even worse than those experienced by Greece. Those are the big differences. It's not that we couldn't suffer consequences in the same vein as they did. It's that our economy is larger and thus potentially capable of sustaining more, i.e. kicking that proverbial can farther down the road. But also, the bigger they are, the harder they fall would probably apply here as well. We'll come back to that thought in a bit. One obvious consequence of turning on and leaving on the money printing spigot is inflation. There is definitely inflation risk if you borrow too much and can't pay it off. We talked in this video about how bad inflation really is, and it just makes sense that if you continue to up the money supply, things are going to continue to get worse in regard to inflation, at least. Milton Friedman popularized the quantitative theory of money, which in short, suggests that if the amount of money in an economy doubles, ceteris paribus, price levels will also double. Yes, I suppose I could have said all else equal, but that wouldn't have made me feel quite as cool. Just like anything else, cars, apples, houses, when there is more of a thing, when there's more money in the system, each one individual unit becomes less valuable. Ray Dalio, in his brilliant video explaining the economic machine, outlines all the levers the federal government can pull to manipulate our economy. He believes there is a time for money printing, but he warns. With great power comes great responsibility. Oh, whoops. No, sorry. Wrong warning. I keep doing that. Uh, this one. However, printing money could easily be abused because it's so easy to do and people prefer it to the alternatives. The key is to avoid printing too much money and causing unacceptably high inflation the way Germany did during its deleveraging in the 1920s. To help get the country back on track after the Great Recession in 2008, for better or for worse, the government pulled this lever hard, using large sums of money to bail out many American businesses. Now, they were glad that they had this in their arsenal, just like they were glad back in the 1940s. But this time, they did very little to put the genie back in the bottle, despite the Simpson-Bowles Commission's best efforts. Seemingly inspired by the fact that, well, nothing about seems to be happening just, just yet. I think we do keep doing this, right? They continued to offer what they began calling quantitative easing, because as Dalio points out, that's the easier thing to do. And then, when COVID hit, they threw caution to the wind and printed money like never before. Thank you, thank you very much. How long will it take for us to come down from this? Is it even possible? I mean, it is possible, but politically speaking. At this point, what happens when the next crisis hits? With interest rates at zero, one of Dalio's levers, and previously unthinkable levels of money printing now commonplace, we don't have many more levers to pull. Just a, a massive shovel to dig ourselves even deeper. Anytime markets even start to correct, the Fed is quick to jump in and stabilize the situation, whatever it may be. 
as if preventing market corrections or much of the short-term pain that might ensue as a result is even part of their job in the first place. That's right, one of their two objectives is to keep inflation under control. That's a big part of why the Fed even exists. The concern, of course, what Dalio alluded to, is a Weimar Republic type situation where faced with a burdensome debt obligation, they try to print their way out. That was the easiest path for the government to take considering their circumstances. And well, that did not end well. Ultimately, it was just one of the many steps paving the way for Hitler's rise to power. Zimbabwe is another classic example of money printing gone wrong, where over the course of a single year, they went from printing $10 bills to $100 billion bills, and today, those same bills are all just as worthless. You've told me you're interested in learning more about financial history, and we're gonna kick off our journey here in a week or two to early 17th century Netherlands. I'd be happy to add either of those two stories, Zimbabwe, Bama Republic, to the list. Just let me know what you're interested in in the comments below. Long story short, inflation destroyed those two economies who also, like us, had the power to print their own currency. Of course, each of those was very different from what we are today. I, I hear you. We're just drawing from the information we have and piecing things together as best we can. This is a recurring refrain with many of my concerns. We have never been here before. Not this exact situation. We don't have enough information to the point that we do not know exactly how this ends. But from what I do know, I, I certainly do not like how it looks. You see, we, I hate having to say we here, we seem to have created a sort of catch-22 for ourselves. Because we've put this much additional money into our system and continue to do so, we're obviously going to continue to experience increased inflationary pressures. One of the most common ways for a developed economy to fight inflation is by allowing interest rates to get ahead of inflation. That way, people are encouraged to save rather than spend. You see, when interest rates at banks are so low, like they are now, you are disincentivized from keeping your money there. When you see the price of everything around you, even basic necessities, increasing by 10%, 15%, 20% or more per year, you'd be better off even just buying whatever physical goods you can, right? Spending your money on something would be a better investment slash use of your money than a savings account. A fact I outlined in this video, which I'll link out to for you directly at the end of this one so that you know where to go next to find out how to profit from all this potential chaos. But the point is, with this method, it's not until people stop rushing out to buy things, no matter the price, and start saving instead, that inflation can begin to come down. So what would this look like if we tried to raise interest rates to get ahead of our inflation? Well, right now, our national debt is fast approaching $30 trillion. Oh, the suspense is killing me! Most, 77% of that, is financed with short and medium term notes, less than 10 years, meaning any change to the Fed funds rate, to interest rates, will relatively quickly and directly impact how much it costs the United States to service all this debt. That is, just to make the minimum interest payments. Our interest service payments on all that debt today is just over $500 billion per year. And that's with the Fed funds rate touching 0%. If interest rates rose to 5%, our interest payments from just our current debt would grow to be roughly three times that, $1.5 trillion each year, give or take a few hundred billion, just to make the minimum payment to avoid default. At 10%, well, that's roughly $3 trillion. And at this point, you may be feeling as though these are all just ridiculous numbers that nobody can really comprehend. What does $3 trillion really even mean anyway, relative to what? Well, we'll put that into perspective here in a second. But before we do, keep in mind, this wouldn't be happening in a vacuum. If we were to do this, raise rates to fight inflation, the country would very likely fall into a recession. Because not only does that mean the government's debt is now more expensive to service, but household debt which is also at all time highs, would also become more expensive for individual Americans to service. Also, as people save more, a natural consequence of rising interest rates, as I already described, they spend less, which means businesses suffer. Not only from people spending less, but also from the higher debt service expense they too experience. 
they would make less money, which leads to businesses being able to employ less people, all of which means the government ends up collecting less in taxes, their source of income, to make their own debt service payments, along with everything else they're supposed to, or at least have committed themselves to do. Federal tax revenues currently sit just under $4 trillion. And that's what's supposed to be able to fund everything from defense to social security to Medicare, everything. If those numbers are coming down, as they likely would if we raised rates, and the government's interest payment obligations are coming up, at what point do these economist holdouts admit that our debt load is a massive problem for us? Are these numbers, this 5% or 10% hypothetical out of the question? The last time we experienced anything that looked like this in terms of real inflation figures was in the late 1970s and early 1980s. Paul Volcker, as Hi. chairman of the Federal Reserve, decided they needed to attack inflation. He knew it would be painful, but he said it was a necessary pain to get our country back on track. He allowed the Fed funds rate to soar to more than 19% at its peak. Not 5%, not 10%, almost 20%. But it worked. Because it once again became prudent for people to save, they did. They stopped spending, they stopped driving up the prices of everything, and inflation came down. After he broke inflation, that's when the great bull market began. Well, the great bull market and bonds began too. Yes. But back then, guess what? Our debt to GDP was hovering around 32%. We could afford to be proactive and attack, as Volcker put it, this very real inflation problem. But now, if we were to make that jump to 20%, our interest service payments alone on just our current debt would be roughly $6 trillion. That's 50% more than the government's current total revenue. But even with a jump to a 20% Fed funds rate, I'm not sure that would be enough at this point. I'm sure it won't be enough by the time politicians finally change their tune about how much of a problem this really is. Remember, for this strategy to work, you have to get this number out ahead of where true inflation, what people are actually experiencing, really is. Not just the government reported CPI number. Because, yeah, sorry, those numbers are very different, as I fully explained in this video. Inflation is worse than everyone is telling you. And the longer we wait, the longer one denies that this is really a problem, the higher this number would have to be to actually work. Unfortunately, we may already be past the point where this quick, although painful, and heaven forbid we put ourselves through a little necessary pain, where this relatively quick fix is even a possibility. This is one of the problems with runaway debt. We have limited our ability to maneuver. Past policy decisions have effectively removed this easy option for policymakers. In fact, it's kind of understandable, not from a moral ground, but from a political perspective, it's understandable why they are inclined to pretend inflation and our, and our expanding debt load are not really problems. It behooves them to kick the can down the road and just pray it doesn't fall apart on their watch. Because at this point, there doesn't seem to be much they can do about it. At least not anything that would be easy. Not anything that might get them reelected. And I'll get to what they could do in a second. But first, I want to take a quick break. I know this has all been a little depressing. Honestly, it's stressful for me. And I'm sure you're like me and get tired of seeing taxpayer dollars constantly going to waste like they seem to have with the Simpson Bowles Commission, seeing as how absolutely no real action was taken. So I wanted you to at least get something out of those hard earned tax dollars of yours that were spent there. So I personally, out of my own pocket, commissioned this project just for you. I hope you enjoy. It's all about making tough, difficult choices. Anytime you have limited resources, Al and I couldn't be happier with where we are in the process, regardless of how the vote turns out. I think we won, and we've won big. There isn't a soul left in America who doesn't understand that this deficit is like a cancer. The plan we submit The era of deficit, the now in Washington The plan we submit It's gonna destroy our country from within The plan we submit It's not some watered-down version of the chairman's small The plan we submit 
Pretty catchy, right? Might get stuck in your head, sorry. But at least it's better than the rhetoric they gave us over on C-SPAN. So how could we fix this? What was the conclusion of the Simpson-Bowles Commission? Just as I would advise any individual facing such a ridiculous imbalance of their revenue and debt load, the commission prescribed a reduction of expenses and an increase in income. Now, they gave specifics, of course, but one thing they all had in common is that they were all painful. The government had to reduce its spending on, on something, well, a lot of things, really, including many entitlement programs like Medicare and Social Security. Nobody wants to do that. And they would have to increase taxes, too. All of these things are not easy. They are not popular. They would lead to some shorter-term pain, which, unfortunately, is generally political suicide. But that necessary pain prescribed by the commission more than 10 years ago would be even more painful today. And we'll only get worse and worse the longer we put it off. But since it would be so politically inexpedient, I mean, you likely wouldn't be able to get elected, let alone re-elected if you did these things. Because it'd be so unpopular to make really any of those changes, let alone enough to make a difference, it is very difficult to imagine any sort of meaningful change on the horizon at least not without a significant crisis happening first. And remember Greece's crisis? I told you earlier we'd come back to how it could be worse for us. Well, they went through all that suffering and they had Germany and the EU to bail them out. We don't have anyone to bail us out. But despite all this, what's the Fed going to do when the market starts to falter again? Whatever it can to not have a crash on their watch. Even if prices are already way overinflated, just think about those terrible optics. So they'll print more, and that might get us through another one like it did in March 2020, and maybe another after that. I don't know how long they can kick that can. No one knows. No country has ever been in the exact position the U.S. is in today. But it does seem obvious, to me at least, that these actions are not sustainable. Yeah, but who really knows? This problem may get resolved, even if I view that as, as unlikely, or at least become less of an issue in the future. Maybe a brilliant economist, who's not just a yes man, teams up with some altruistic politicians, and they're able to convince the public to endure some short to medium term pains in order to avoid a massive depression. Yeah, I suppose it's, it's possible. Regardless, I like to be prepared. Like wearing a seatbelt every time I get in the car. I don't plan on getting in an accident. I probably won't. But since I can be prepared, I'll make every effort to ensure that I am. That's why I created this video, to detail some of the ways that you can profit from this inflation. And pay special attention to the bonus tips at the end of that one. They help address many of the concerns from this video. Don't let anyone gaslight you. This is a problem. You should prepare yourself as much as you can. After this last clip coming up from the Federal Reserve printer, click on this video right here to see how. Good luck out there. Take care. Thank <laughs> you.